bagel. You're almost universally adored, particularly within the industry. Has it been kind of almost like a holiday for you to play someone who's almost <laughs> universally loathed? <laughs> no, it's been fun. It's been it's been great playing a. a it has been really good playing a character who's who just doesn't care about you know how he's perceived in a way. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I don't care about the impression I make on 99% of people. Right, right. There's a tiny minority who I'm very keen to impress. So right. it's totally ego-driven. Yes. But it seems perhaps kind of less obviously ego-driven because I don't appear to care when it comes to most people. I'm just right. a complete snob about <laughs> who, who right. I'm trying to impress. Right, 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 right. Whereas, you know, taxi drivers, doorman, you don't care. You're totally indiscriminate. You want everyone to love you. Absolutely. I know. It's <laughs> terrible. It's incredibly needy. <laughs> It's a classic British character, actually, in that it's the person that he conti continually disappoints, but you, you want him to do well. It's Basil Fawlty, it's David <laughs> Brent, it's, it's Captain Mannering, it's, you know, it's the sort of the lover will loser kind of guy. I've never known, I've never played a character whereby the knives are so out already <laughs> before it's even been seen, you know. It's like, I'm sure there are people out there who are like, I can't believe Toby Young is having a film made of his life. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Is there an element where you're thinking, I really am the lord of all this and I should be able to say things? That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. I feel yeah. I should be the guy out there with a megaphone yeah. doing the kind of Eric von Stroheim number exactly. and ordering everyone around. <laughs> like, who the hell is this Bob Whitey guy? What does he think? Yeah. He knows this story better than me. I lived it. Exactly. exactly. But uh, of course, you know, if I was the guy with a the megaphone, there'd be no one in the room. <laughs> Hello, Toby. Hi. So we saw you there, banned from the set of your own story. I mean, is that usual? Are, are screenwriters usually not welcome? Um, well, veteran screenwriters um, tell you that um, being the writer on the set of your film is a bit like being a dad in a delivery suite. Right. And, you know, I didn't even write the film. I wrote the book the film was based on. So I was kind of like the dad's best mate in the delivery suite, and it's, the midwife certainly didn't want any tips from me about how to deliver the baby. So you were hired as the first screenwriter of the story. Are, are screenwriters usually not welcome? Um, well, veteran screenwriters um, tell you that um, being the writer on the set of your film is a bit like being a dad in a delivery suite. Right. And, you know, I didn't even write the film. I wrote the book the film was based on, so I was kind of like the dad's best mate in the delivery suite, and it's, the midwife certainly didn't want any tips from me about how to deliver the baby. So you were hired as the first screenwriter of the story of your own life, is that right? There's this saying in Hollywood that um, the first meeting is always the best. Okay, I was interviewing various different producers who were petitioning me for the job of turning the book into a film, and I interviewed Stephen Woolley, and, um, and he was just incredibly kind of effusive. It was like, it's one of the best books I've ever read. You've written the Catch-22 of our generation. You are clearly the man to adapt it for the screen. And I was like, you're hired. Yeah. Um, okay, fast forward three months to the second meeting. Okay, I go to his office. Um, at this point, I've turned in quite, a, quite an extensive treatment. Um, the meeting is supposed to be at 4.30. At 5.45, an hour and 15 minutes after it's supposed to have begun, you know, I'm sitting in the corridor, his second assistant puts her head round the door of his office and says, Stephen can't meet with you today, he just doesn't have time, but he's read the treatment, he wants you to know you're off the project. And that, that, that was the second meeting. And that was it. You were like the biological father at that point, but you no longer <laughs> had was, access was, to the child. That's right. I see. Simon Pegg there, playing you in the film. Um, I mean, it's one of those questions, isn't it, that, that you often ask, who would play you in the movie of your life? What, yeah. what was your reaction when you heard that the pigster had got it? I was actually relieved because um, at one stage, um, Orlando Bloom's name was in the frame. <laughs> uh, not that he's a bad actor, but um, I was concerned that, you know, people who'd never met me before, but who saw the film, would then meet me for the first time and say, you were played by Orlando Bloom. <laughs> yeah, with Simon Pegg, it's, it's not that much of a stretch. He looks like he needed to put a little bit of weight on there. Was that, was that necessary for yeah. the role? The first meeting I had um, with Simon and the director, um, the director looked at Simon, looked at me, looked at Simon, looked at me and said, you know what, Simon, if you're going to play this guy, you're either going to have to gain 20 pounds or we're going to have to put you in a fat suit. <laughs> And I thought he was joking, you know, ha ha. Um, first day of principal photography, um, he'd actually gained a stone. Um, and, uh, and this was coming off the back of a film called Run, Fat Boy, Run. You know, even having gained the weight to play a character called Fat Boy, he still wasn't fat enough <laughs> to play me. <laughs>
Now, I suppose now that the, the film's coming out, you might become a celebrity yourself. How would that be for you? Um, well, you know, the only time so far um, anyone's ever asked me for my autograph, I was coming out of um, Broadcasting House, having just done Loose Ends, and this stage door Johnny kind of saw me and very tentatively kind of approached me with a bit of cardboard and a pen, and I said, you're the first person that's ever asked for my autograph. At which point he went like this. And I literally had to chase him down the street, <laughs> rugby tackle him in order to... Give him my order. Sign his forehead once he was on the ground. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. Oh, well, Toby, thank you very much. We hope it happens for you. Give the man some love. <laughs> Lord knows he needs it. Now, someone else who doesn't care who he offends is the jewel in the crown of stand-up comedy, Chris Rock. I met up with him on the first leg of his world tour here in Britain. Movie star, writer, director and stand-up comic. With 